This is our news, the weekend edition, and on the broadcast tonight. One man dead and two others hospitalized following a shooting here in the capital. Plus, is Oban economically viable? We put that question to a local financial expert. And Percy, the pot cake, gears up to take to the stage. News is brought to you by Alive. Good evening, I'm Andrew Nold and thanks for joining us. Police are investigating a triple shooting here in the capital that's left one man dead and two others fighting for their lives in hospital. Now, not much information on what exactly occurred, but police say several men were standing on the street just off Corridor Avenue shortly before 10 last night when they were approached by a gunman who opened fire on them. Now, when officers arrived on the scene, they met three men lying on the ground, suffering from apparent gunshot injuries. EMS personnel took the men to the hospital, where one later succumbed to his injuries. The other victims are said to be listed in serious condition. And as investigations are continuing into this incident, police are appealing to members of the public for any information that can assist in identifying and locating the suspects. In other news, well, despite another Heads of Agreement being signed this week, the spotlight remains on the contentious Oban Heads of Agreement. And a financial expert is giving his take on the multi-billion dollar deal. Jillian Gray has more details in this report. Much has been said in recent weeks about the absence of an environmental impact assessment before the Minnesota administration signed a heads of agreement for the oil refinery project. However, President of the Bahamas Institute of Chartered Accountants, Gowan Bo, says his concern is about whether the project is economically viable. From my perspective, I would expect that a large part of the story to be written on this is still going to hinge on them being able to demonstrate that it is economically viable. Now, that also leaves the um, avenue for the environmental impact to be factored in. Because if I say from a study coming back that this is the damage it's going to cause, it is either a remedial cost in terms of saying it's going to cost X amount in order to restore it to the, the land and, and the surroundings into its original state. There's going to be a economic penalty for the degradation and damage. Um, or there's going to be some compensation that has to be meted out. And if we look at it from that perspective, we have to make sure that that is factored into the economic evaluation of whether this is a viable project. In addition to the EIA not being done, another major bone of contention from critics has been centered on the concessions the government gave. As an accountant, Bo said he thinks the concessions may have been a bit too generous. Realistic net positive, meaning that we can realistically expect those um, benchmarks to be achieved, the employment, the economic expansion, the additional auxiliary taxes coming through, then we can do so. But I will say, if we look back um, for decades now, we have gone into negotiations with foreign direct investors on a bespoke basis, case by case. And if we are serious about what we're going to do in the future of the country, we have to have a defined land policy, concession policy, and uh, what I would call metrics and measurement policy that allows us to say whether or not what we've given is actually returning what we expect. Because I think if we look at many a project up to this point in time and look at the concessions that have been granted and measure against what the economic benefit, um, I imagine a number of them will fall short. In his estimation, Bo says tax concessions should always be from the perspective that if the government foregoes a tax, then the entity would pick up some expense that the government would usually pay, something he says he has not seen up to this point. Every investor will promise the world, but in reality we need to be in a situation where we can tangibly see where is it going to come from, and then more importantly be able to actually measure it on a regular basis to see whether they've met them. And our agreements for tax incentives should always be laden with performance measures, that if you fail to meet this, then all of the concessions are actually going to be changed accordingly. Oban execs say funding for the project was secured and bank letters would be presented to the government. The environmental impact assessment will not be completed for another few weeks. Reporting for Our News, I'm Gillian Gray. 
And as the debate rages on over the controversial Oban deal, a prominent pastor is now weighing in on the ordeal and calling for answers. Our Georgie O'Bain tells us more. Reverend Dr. C.B. Moss says if Prime Minister Dr. Hubert Minnis doesn't clear up the concerns surrounding the Oban deal, then the deal itself must die. A sign erected outside of Moss's Bain Town Church read, Oban, not good. But according to Moss, if the necessary answers are not given, those concerned will bind together and bring it to an end. This is what we were going to put up on the board. Oban must die. And we meant in its presented form. However, if the Prime Minister is able to ameliorate a lot of the concerns that exist, then we will not put that up. While several environmental groups, including the Bahamas National Trust and Brief, have come forward stating that they cannot support the Oban deal, Moss says there are three major concerns that he needs the government to address. Our major concerns are, one, that the project is under normal circumstances not considered environmentally um, supportive of the area that uh, it is being placed in. That's number one. Number two, the process as we understand it is deeply flawed and uh, um, that would have to be seriously addressed and satisfied before we can give even um, a basic consideration for support. Moss said he was disappointed in the response of Environment Minister Ramal Ferreira, who dodged questions on the Oban deal. Given how vocal Ferreira was on the environmental issues while in opposition, Moss said he should have stepped up and been direct with the reporters now that he is in the position of power. Disappointed um, in a word, because we have worked with uh, the Honorable Minister prior to his appointment to the Cabinet uh, on a number of projects <clears throat> and we respect him highly for his knowledge about the environment, for his commitment to the environment and for his determination to uh, work to protect the environment. Now of course what is going on now I'm not sure but I was disappointed because someone um, in this capacity would have better served himself and the country if he were able to respond, you know, more openly. Moss said the final straw remains, no answers, no deal. We wish the nation to know that if that project is not in the best interest of the Bahamas, then we must fight it. Reporting for our News Weekend Edition, I'm Giorgio Bain. All right, thanks, Giorgio. And we will take our first break here. But still to come on our news, the cookie caterer introduces his new app, making it easier for you to satisfy your cookie monster. Plus, a major insurer releases its post-disaster continuity plan. Those stories and more when our news returns. <music> 